Uh, Avicho, you founded Prep Me in 2001, mm -hmm. sold it 10 years later in 2011. Yeah. Um, that was actually the year uh, we founded Imagine K-12, the yeah. world's first educational technology accelerator. And, and Keith, you founded Mystery Science, I think in 2013. We just celebrated our fourth birthday in January. And, and you just celebrated your fourth birthday um, with, with, with Doug Peltz, and you guys uh, actually did YC in summer 2017. So this, uh, the idea of this podcast was to have a, a conversation about educational technology, about um, maybe some, some current past and future stories around, around ed tech. Um, one of the things that, that started the, uh, that, that, that was the initiative for this conversation was a blog post that Avicho wrote in 2011 titled, Why Educational Startups Do Not Succeed. His summary of that post, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just give it really quickly since he helpfully put it in the post itself, <laughs> was that, that entrepreneurs in education built the wrong kind of business. They think of it as a quality problem when actually it's a cost problem. Building an education um, uh, does not follow an internet company's growth curve. And because of that, it's, um, you have to think way longer term than venture capitalists are interested in funding you. So um, the opportunities for servicing education are actually not in the US, they're actually in Asia. Um, so so like it's not really gonna be relevant for another five years. That was in 2011, so maybe it's relevant now because that would have led us to 2016. Maybe eventually you can start by sort of reflecting on why you wrote that post and um, and how you're thinking about it today, and then and hopefully you guys can start having a conversation about that. Uh, yeah, I think it's a great that's a great summary. That's a great intro. I mean, I, um, the the genesis of that blog post for us was really we started this company. Um, we had a lot of ideas around how to make education better using machine learning and using technology and personalization, um, and it turned out a lot of um, a lot of people wanted that in the early days, and so we got some early signal that that's that's actually what the market wanted. And then um, very quickly, things started to plateau from a growth perspective. And, and I think my conclusion was that we'd saturated a lot of the early adopters, and the mainstream market just wanted different things. The mainstream market really cared much more about cost rather than quality. Um, and the, the fundamental sort of uh, disconnect between people who start education businesses and the, the consumer themselves is, is fundamentally that. The people who start education businesses tend to care much, much more about the quality of the product. And in the US, the average consumer just looks at it differently and the buying psychology is fundamentally different. And there, there are a whole host of reasons why I think that's a case that we can get into that I think actually have very interesting downstream ramifications on things like politics. About whether people value education yeah. in I of mean, itself, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and I, I mean, actually, so if we want to sort of um, unpack that, the, the, the thing I think, and this is, I have very little other than uh, anecdotal to back this up. So this is my current belief, so I could be wrong. We'll love to hear probably from Keith why I'm wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think what happened was post-World War II America was really good for, for a lot of people. Uh, so I grew up in Ohio, uh, in Kentucky. And so, you know, if, if you're in the 60s or the 70s, you could get a job at the GM factory, you could make a good wage, your spouse could make a good wage. So maybe together you make $80,000 a year um, working in the factory and a house cost $80,000 a year, right? So that'd be like living in San Francisco and you and your spouse make like $3 million a year and you never went to college. I think you would rationally, you would look at that and be like, why would I go to college? I'm making $3 million a year. Um, I can buy my house and I can have a great life. Um, and... And then the people that were sort of born, let, just to make the math easy, let's say you were born in 1982, so you'd be 18 in the year 2000, you'd be graduating from high school. Um, the people who were born in 1982 were raised by people of that generation. And so kind of the value system sort of, I think, came from a belief that the world would still work that way. Uh, but the world doesn't actually work that way, right? Like starting with 2000, you know, the internet with the crash in 2001, the massive, you know, there was in between little recessions, there was a crash in 2008. So basically, if you were an adult in 2000, you've, you've kind of been in and out of work for most of your adult life. Um, if you were kind of in that camp, if you didn't go to college. Um, and and that that kind of, I think, has bleed over effects into, into things like politics, where like the, the system, the way you thought the world was going to work, the world doesn't actually work that way anymore. And that disconnect has been a really hard transition. And there's this entire sort of, you know, 15 to 20 year range of adults that kind of got trapped by it. Um, and I think we're seeing some of the effects of that right now in politics.
Keith, maybe maybe you can react to that. I, I'm especially interested in in this perspective, which I think was more true in 2001 than it is in 2018, which is that if you're going to make any money in educational technology, you better appeal directly to parents uh, because schools weren't going to pay for technology. Actually, they'd been burned with a whole bunch of hardware and technology wasn't so relevant to them at the time. That seems like it shifted a bit. So maybe you can... Yeah, I mean, one one interesting thing when talking about the space is it's it's I think it's actually hard to talk about the education space, like elementary versus high school are totally different markets in many respects, right. and parents versus versus um, institutions are are very different markets. So it's interesting, you know, we often sort of group this as the education space or the education industry, and and it dep- we have to be careful about gen- generalizing. Um, and so. Um, I mean, just one line, I mean, Mystery Science, we are helping fix science education in this country by giving elementary teachers a remote science expert to co-teach the class with them. So we effectively sell schools a curriculum that that replaces the textbook. You can think of it in a sense as a digital textbook. Um, and our whole pitch uh, to to teachers and to schools is that this is better. This is better education. It's better than the textbooks. It's better than whatever the conventional curriculum is. And it's notable that that our teachers and the students and even parents increasingly are starting to recognize that it's better. Um, so, so it you know it does give me pause to, to to hear you know you can't build a business by making something better. I think there are some interesting challenges to to trying to how you communicate that your product is better and how the customers appreciate it. Um, but yeah, you know, so for, for just very early on, we're, we've gotten a lot of traction selling into schools and and getting appreciated for making a better educational product. It does seem to be true to to back up Avicel's point about about parents in general not being willing to pay, especially sort of the 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 mass market to be willing to pay for education quality. There, the the value that they place on that in the United States, at least, is still not clear. The, there's a lot of money being spent outside of school and education, but it's test prep and tutoring for pretty affluent families. Isn't that true? Yeah, it's, it, it is It is an interesting. So um, we are, are preparing for our transition from selling to schools, selling direct to parents. And so we've sort of dipped our toe in the water with homeschoolers, which is a relatively small market, and are getting ready to go mainstream. And so there's still a lot yet for us to prove about that. But there's a couple interesting observations that we've made so far. Um, I think the thing that makes the market a funny market, that the parent education market, is that you get this product for free. So, you know, basically through property taxes, that's how you pay for school. But, you know, as an entrepreneur trying to build a business in the space, it's interesting to compete with free out there because parents feel like, well, I, I have this thing. And so one thing we've noticed in interviewing parents is that at the very young age, parents feel very involved in learning. So, you know, from birth to when they send their kid off to kindergarten or preschool, um, uh, the the educational value of the products they're buying is is one of the dominant factors in considering whether you're going to buy that speak and sound or that play mat or that book or or whatnot. It's a huge factor in buying decisions. Um, once you send your kid off to school full time, parents remain involved in some respects. I think reading is one of the main ones. They still think feel like it's their job to make sure they're reading regularly to their child and and helping to reinforce you know their ability to read at home. And then it sort of drops off for the next like six to eight years. Your involvement as a parent as a parent in education is making sure you're supporting the school and going to parent teacher conference and you know picking the right neighborhood or you sort of you get involved in that respect, not by buying products and sort of delivering education at home. And then towards the end of high school, it kind of ramps up again with the whole like getting into college thing or shoring up a weak grade or whatnot. Yeah. Well, it certainly seems that um, that your prediction that venture capitalists wouldn't fund ed tech companies has not come true, especially <laughs> since 2011. <laughs> and it was very interesting. We founded Imagine K-12 in 2011, and the companies that we funded alone received hundreds of millions of dollars in venture investment. So obviously, venture capitalists saw opportunity somewhere, sure. right? Yeah. I think uh, I think they, they basically made the mistake that I... Uh, that I tried to call out in that post, which is I think they they expected that the ramp of those companies from from a business perspective would look like an internet company ramp, um, whereas as I think 
I, I mean, I, I don't know the numbers of most of the American companies, but I think they pale in comparison to like Chinese education companies that go from like zero to a billion, you know, an IPO in seven years. It's just like the ramps are just crazy in a mm. place like China. And on the There's on a lot paper, more people in China too, as it turns out. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, I mean that's that's part of it, right? And and um, and the public school system is much worse. Exactly, right? And I think that the cultural dynamics are different. The public right. school dynamics are different. Um, there there are a lot of factors there for sure. But but the net effect of it then ends up being, on paper, you might have a company here as an education company that's worth a hundred million dollars or two hundred million dollars and has raised a lot of venture capital. Um, but do the revenue numbers actually back that up, right? Could you actually take that public on the market in two to three years at a billion dollar valuation? And what kind of revenue would you have to do to support that? And I think by and large, that hasn't been the case, which is why you haven't really seen education company IPOs. But um, is that unique to education companies? Because just take consumer tech generally. Yeah. There's many hundred million dollar plus valuation consumer tech companies yeah. that don't have the revenue to back it up. Yeah. And there are also many consumer tech companies in China where the Chinese equivalent will scale much faster than the American equivalent. Yeah. The, the reason I, so I, it's certainly true that I think you have a lot of companies that are, that are, end up in this kind of dead zone, but the reason they do is because there are some that make it out. Like every now and then you'll get a mm-hmm. Snapchat or a WhatsApp or an Uber or a Lyft or a Stripe or like the list goes on, right? Like in, most of these companies are not that old, right? Like these are all seven to eight year old companies, right? So, um, it's it's the hope that you stumble into an Uber or a Stripe that really I think supports the the rest of the ecosystem. Right. But I don't see like where is the Uber or the Stripe of the education space. Yeah, yeah. The closest is probably you know ABC Mouse yeah. recent billion dollar valuation straight to to parents. Yeah. Um, and Teachers Pay Teachers would be another one. Yeah. Um, and you know Chegg is worth two and a half Chegg. billion now. That's actually a great example. That's actually the one that I use most often, which is by and large, if you look at Chegg, the way they got to where they are is they didn't reinvent digital learning; they just made textbooks cheaper. Right? Yeah, but they've com- they've almost completely shifted. If you look at if you look at Chegg's website today, yeah. they don't talk about textbooks anymore. It's they're 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 a smarter way to student, totally. whatever that means. Yeah. And <laughs> so so that you know, but I think it's all about digital education for Czech now. And, and I, you know, I know it's a multi hundred million dollar business for them. Um, I was going to ask, do you know do you know what their number how that number breaks down between like their core textbook business versus their I, I think digital? the core textbook business and volume is bigger, but the digital business is 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 growing. rapidly growing totally. and scaling. So it's interesting. There 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 are there are Ed tech companies that are scaling. Um, certainly, revenue has been tough yeah. <laughs> for many of them. Although, you know, I, even I look at companies like Mystery Science, which has actually scaled revenue without mentioning any numbers very well yeah. um, by selling to schools. I do think selling to parents still because of this this free zone. Um, it and, and and we have to be clear that. For better or worse, that free zone is is for the mass market in middle America. There is plenty of more affluent families that spend tens of thousands of dollars every year on private mm-hmm. schools, on private tutors, on an totally. SAT prep, on all sorts of educational advantages that um, that do constitute a pretty big market, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And it's notable that ABC Mouse is in some ways, I think of them as the new leapfrog. Like they're targeting that same mm-hmm. age demographic that leapfrog used to, um, which is outside of that free zone. Yeah, it's it's the early state, like the early. Yep. Uh, yeah, and I think that, I mean, that pattern has held for a while too. That's why, I mean, in that blog post, I called out something like five years because I think what you're starting to see is cult- cultural shifts just take a while, right? And I, and I do think there is a cultural shift. Uh, and the cultural shift essentially is that generation of parents that were 18 in the year 2000, or, you know, they're, they're parents now and they have five-year-olds, right? So the, the person that was 18 in the year 2000 would be 36 today. So they probably, you know, they might have some young kids. Uh, and I think they're starting to look back at, at, you know, they probably don't have a 25-year-old, but they might have a six-year-old or an eight-year-old. So starting to look back at their life and saying, wait a second, like, what happened? Oh, the world changed. And so I think people are generally pretty smart. And so they're start that cultural change is starting mm. to happen. Or that might be the 36-year-old that's now the head of the science department and is looking at it and saying, wait a second, I grew up with the internet. Like, I get this. We should be, be- buying better stuff. And so I do think that change is happening, but we're kind of at like the early parts of that change. Um, and hopefully it accelerates, but I don't think we're like, I don't think the mainstream is like flipped quite yet. There's another aspect of the cultural change, which seems to me is a cultural change within schools, which yeah. for me has shifted radically. Um, you know, uh, in 2011, when you wrote that post, the fact is that most schools were not 
connected with reasonable internet access. Yep. Today, almost all of them in the United States are connected with high, you know the, enough bandwidth for more than one person could run YouTube <laughs> at the same yeah. at the same yeah. time. Uh, many schools of directors of technology and are thinking about their their technology buying plans. So it seems to me, I don't know how, how you think about yeah, this. Yeah, I, I think that's piece. in the school space. I think that's one of the most significant things is. It's from my perspective, it seems like it is mirroring the enterprise cycle lagging about 10 years or so. So when we started four years ago, we finally could assume that most of our teachers would have a computer and a, a, at least one computer in the classroom, a projector so the kids could see it and an internet connection. Not the best internet connection, often consumer grade shared. It would slow down during lunch hour and then speed up afterwards. But we could assume this baseline level. And that was 2014. You know, so maybe that only happened around 2012 or yeah. so. Like that's that's relatively late right. compared to what happened in business. And so, you know, I think we are we are, you know, really deep into this first generation cycle where there's a whole wave of companies that that are just bringing efficiency to schools. So it's like, hey, now that we're on the internet, we can make attendance easier. We can make grading easier. We can make student rostering easier. We can make, you know, a lot of back office stuff. And so that's a whole wave of companies that aren't even involved in learning. They're just involved in making these business operations more efficient because, hey, internet's you know, software is good for that. Yeah, totally. And then there's the second parallel we're seeing, and this was was part of the wave we're riding in other companies where. It used to be that there were directors of technology in business who made this software purchasing decision and then rolled out to everyone. And so, you know, that's how the school director of technology started. And now, you know, we take the Salesforce sales model to these teachers where Salesforce didn't get permission from an IT department. They just got someone in marketing who signed up for a free account and got started. And then three or four or five more people got it. And eventually the IT department had to take notice because they had 50 users in the company. Yeah. And so, so we do the same thing with our software and, and other ed tech companies too. I don't think we pioneered this. Yeah, the so-called um, pull model instead of the push model, instead of having to wine and dine supervisors <laughs> around the country, you actually convince persuade teachers that you have a great product. And in the end, they persuade their administrators to buy, right? Yeah, yeah. And there's a bunch of interesting shifts that happen there. So, you know, Salesforce was selling against incumbent CRM providers, like I assume Oracle had a product like that. And their product looks different, like the onboarding for it looks different and the and the cost structure looks different. And we're seeing that same shift. We've got the Pearson, McGraw, Houghton Mifflin, that generation of companies who still assume they're going to sell top down and roll out. Right. And then Mystery Science and other ed tech companies that that just do the a la carte and roll it up. So Avicel, uh, do you think do you think your conclusions still stand today, or have you modified your take given what's happened over the past? I mean, you sort of gave it five years, and it's been yeah. seven. Would you, l let me let me just read your conclusions, and and I'm wondering if you think they're still valid today, or, yeah. or whether you would, you would counsel new ed tech entrepreneurs differently. This is the good and bad of putting things in writing, right? <laughs> no. Well, no, but, but, no. but, but yeah, and, and uh, to be fair, I, I disagree with very little of what he wrote in, in 2011, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and so the, the real question is, have, have we moved on? And, and if so, no, how should we move on? Yeah. So your, your first point was don't make a better product, make a cheaper product. Yeah. Which by the way, this efficiency stuff that Keith Plays was right talking about plays directly to that. Yep. Don't start in the US, start in, or other developed countries because it'll be too slow, start in Asia. Um, don't take VC money. <laughs> um, don't target the middle class because they don't really care. And don't expect a quick flip yep. or quick growth. Uh, you wanna, you wanna, you know, you can take those as a whole or one at a time, however you like. I think I can take them as a whole. I, I think they're generally still true, mm -hmm. um, but there are pockets where it's starting to change. And I think the places where you're starting to see it change are especially around, I think schools have changed a lot. I think things like, I was, I was talking to um, uh, Dan and Clever, and, and he was talking about how Chromebooks have just changed the landscape. Dan, the CTO of, Correct. Dan Carroll, yeah. the CTO of uh, Clever. Also, is Clever YC? Yeah, Clever yeah. is a YC. Yeah. Should be an Imagine K-12, long story <laughs> for another time. But <laughs> um, so he was, he was making the, the really great observation that, that to your point too, I think, is that just changes the game. All of a sudden, you can actually assume that there's, there's an internet connection and a thing that looks like a laptop and is pretty reasonable and has good mm -hmm. specs. Um, so I think kind of like the, the fundamentals ha have 
the fundamentals have changed, but the way that the fundamentals then manifest in terms of startups is just starting to change because there's a phase shift there. So now that internet is good, now that the person making the decisions might be the department head or the teacher, uh, now that there are products that, that you can just sign up for and you don't need to go through the the district, like all of those are, are structural changes that have just started to happen in the last, you know, let's say two years, three years that, that that's really gone mainstream. So I think looking forward now, so I think the question really is like, are they still tr true today? Take a snapshot. I think the answer is mostly still true. Uh, but that's not really the question that, that like a startup should be asking or a founder should be asking is like, will it be true in five years? I don't think it will be true in five years, right? Like if you're starting a company today, the question really is, are there enough customers for you to get going? Mm -hmm. And has the world evolved such that in five years, it will be dramatically different and look a lot more like your early adopters? And I think it will. Well, they're um, all forward looking totally. statements. So, so yeah. I, I think you're basically saying, um, ignore that blog post because the future the future is different. The future looks I think actually the, better for EdTech. The, I think the future looks a lot better. Um, the, fu the, the present as of today still kind of looks like that, but the trend lines are good, right? And so you look at Mystery Science or you look at No Red Ink or you look at Clever. There are all these right. companies that I think have managed to get um, pretty substantial traction. Um, and so if you're starting today, I think uh, some of these markets are actually... Um, you can get quick growth, You can, you right? can get like pretty reasonable like growth pretty quickly. Uh, I think the part of it that's still hard is actually the monetization. And, sure. and I think that part of it is just going to be a phase shift. And I think that will come. Um, and so it's, it, it kind of is a case-by-case -case basis. I think in the early, early parts of the market, kind of what Keith was saying, if, you, if you're targeting four-year-olds and five-year-olds and six-year-olds, you might actually be able to make a lot of progress and actually monetize because the, the buying psychology, I think, has changed. Uh, if you're talking about 14-year-olds, you might not be able to. Um, right? And so it kind of depends on the market that you're going after. I, I still think the Asia thing is 100% true. Like I think if you if you just look at the growth of companies and the revenue in those markets, I think China is just an amazing, amazing market. And so um, unfortunately, it's not. Most people are not faced with the decision of should I start a company in the U.S. or should I start a company in China? It's it, like it's, one or the other. It's and so, difficult in the U.S. to go yeah. overseas first and, and vice you versa. just don't know the markets and vice versa. Yeah, and so that's, that's not really for most people a decision point. Uh, I think the, the more important decision point for most, most entrepreneurs probably is like which part of the market am I going after and why and is it – is it higher ed? Is it you know, uh, nine, you know high school? Is it science education? Is it math education? Is it um, pre-K? There are a lot of ways to segment the market. And so I think some of those have moved much more than others and the trajectory looks really good. So I think there are going to be pockets of pretty substantial change in the next five years. And some of I think will just take a while longer. Like I actually think high schools will take a, a, a bit longer than some of these others just because the phase shift, right? Like the parents, sure. the, you, you kind of have to have the market grow into it. Keith, maybe um, we can talk a little bit about of each other's original first point, which was the precise opposite of what you guys did later, right? Which is not don't build a better product, build a cheaper product. You guys, in fact, uh, did build didn't build a massively expensive product, but you built a better product. What you your whole idea was to build better science education, and I think this is an interesting conversation because the real issue in American education isn't price; it's quality. It's how can we get better outcomes? Mm -hmm. Maybe you can reflect a little bit on, on, yeah, that, on, I mean, that, on that opportunity. Yeah. So I definitely think there's opportunity to build a better product um, in the education space. I think, I think right now that's, that's absolutely true. And I think, it's, I think it was true four years ago, even when we started, um, that you could build a better product. And um, I think to the extent that the advice is useful of don't build a better product, build a cheaper one, it's not unique to the education space. Like there are many, many startups whose growth is driven by lowering cost. You know, I mean, the, the whole media space, like, like the news media space online is being driven by free newspapers instead of, you know, print newspapers. And lots of people argue, oh my gosh, consumers don't care about the quality of reporting anymore. All they care about is something that's free. And it's, you know, I think it's true that free is a really important driver in every industry or lowering cost is an important driver in every industry. And that's not unique to education. Um, but but the conclusion that the consumer doesn't care about quality, I think is a um, it's one I'm very hesitant to make because oftentimes we as the creator have a unique set of of things that we think are important, and then we imbue that in a product. And if it doesn't resonate with people in the same way, you know, it's oftentimes you have to charge a little bit more. Then it's easy to to think, oh, oh, they just don't care about quality. Like I could imagine you know, in the furniture space, just to pick a totally different industry, 
you know, one of the high-end um, designer furniture stores for many years was Design Within Reach. Never actually shopped there, but I walked in one and they sell like $20,000 couches. That's probably like the low-end couch there. <laughs> you know, and you can imagine this, the whole fine furniture industry concluding the average consumer, they don't care about design. Like, they just want cheap stuff. And then Ikea comes along and brings design to the masses. And so do you think mm. Ikea thinks, oh, consumers don't, don't appreciate good design? It's like, no, they absolutely do appreciate good design. They're not going to pay $20,000 for, for, for a well-designed couch, they'll, they'll, but they'll pay 500 bucks for a well-designed couch, maybe even 1000 It's more bucks. of a balance for that sort of consumer between yeah. cost consciousness and quality. Yeah. So, so I don't think there's something unique about the education space that, that you know, to conclude consumers don't appreciate this. I think that... You, you create more value, you price it right, and you play the, you have to figure out the market dynamics to scale, um, but, but consumers, you know, customers appreciate it. And in our case, we started out focusing on teachers. Um, and, you know, the challenging thing in education, and this is also true of other industries, is how does the consumer know what's better? How does the customer know what's better? Um, and teachers, you know, our particular customers, they don't have a lot of strong opinions about, you know, a better science resource would have the following attributes. Like, so, so they're not searching for better uh, necessarily, at least with a clear set of guidelines. But when they see it, they can recognize it. And we hear all sorts of feedback from teachers like, wow, I've never seen it's a lesson taught this way before. I don't know what it is about it. There's just something different. And you, you can see it in their testimonials that they're sort of, they're groping at their own identification of what it is. So they can tell it even though they, they can't put their finger on it. You know, and you can imagine a consumer like you make a healthier, you know, granola bar and, and you know, the average consumer doesn't know what is the right balance of nutrients to make something healthier. Um, but the, the, they could notice how they feel in the long run by eat, by changing their diet. I think that's actually a good example. I, I um, yeah, I mostly disagree with what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more. So let me. I, I'll I'll give you examples. Right. Tesla started at the high end, right? And like electric cars probably wouldn't have happened had Tesla not priced it the way they did. And there was like a bunch of work that they had to do to come down. The iPhone kind of worked that way. Like a lot of technology cycles, I think, actually work with things that are more expensive, that are smaller in niche, and then they like come down in price over time. Um, because often there is a trade-off between quality and cost. Now, in, in like content creation, I think you could argue that the tooling has gotten so much better that the cost of production has come down dramatically. Uh, and therefore, you don't really have the same trade-offs that you used to. And so um, I think like Mystery Science is, is a great example, right? Like software tooling has gotten so good that you guys can have massive leverage and create really high-quality stuff uh, and price it very competitively, right? It's actually affordable for people, but it's really, really high quality. Um, but a lot of things don't have... It is a trade-off, right? And so to the extent that you have to make the trade-off, um, I think that's actually where things get hard, is like the average person is going to make likely a different trade-off than the person building the product. And that's kind of where I think companies end up making the wrong trade-off. Is like the, the person building the product says, clearly if it costs 10% more, but it's 20% better or 30% better, I should. that's a worthwhile trade-off. And that's actually not the buying psychology of the consumer. And that's where I think on the margin, things like get harder. Well, do you think, but do you think that's unique to education? Like most consumer products. I, I think it's unique to certain certain things. And I think the characteristic of education that makes it, there are two, there are two parts of education, which is kind of like healthcare that I think make it really hard. One is the long ROI cycle. Right? It's just like, it pays off in 20 years. And, and us, uh, like humans are just bad at that, right? We were, that's why healthcare, I think, has some of these challenges. And the other is, I think, your point, which is, how do I know it's better, right? Like, what, do you, what, what tells me that it's better if the payoff cycle is 20 years or granola, right? Like, better food for you. Nutrition is a great example, right? People make all sorts of suboptimal decisions in the short term uh, when it's clear what the right long-term decisions are. And, and most people just don't make the right long-term trade-off. And I think it's, it's exactly this. It's like the payoff is really, really long, and, and evaluating quality in the short term is really tough. Um, you, you, you wouldn't really argue that people um, don't make quality trade-offs, though, for food. They sure do. They might be wrong and they might be a little opaque, but they sure do make those trade-offs all the time. And I, I think that's probably true in education as well and healthcare. How do you, how do you mean? Well, people think certain granolas are better than other granolas and think pe certain berries are better than other totally. berries and think like the, they'll pay extra money for organic, for example, like, because they, they're, if they believe and, that. And of course there's, because, and part of that is that there are, um, there are shorthands for mm. what quality tastes yeah. better. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> it's like so, you know, a mystery science lesson tastes better than than a dry textbook without Doug totally. actually doing it. So, yeah. so maybe maybe there are ways for people to signal quality and to yeah. believe in quality. I, I look at kind of as like, you know, the the way that I think like um, the way that we would evaluate quality here 
I think like making it fun and accessible, absolutely part of quality. But fundamentally, it's about driving educational outcomes, right? Like if you didn't learn the thing better, is it actually better quality? I would argue if you didn't actually learn the thing, like it, it's not better quality. So we need shorthands because because the ultimate educational outcome, which means you get a better job mm -hmm. that's more satisfying, higher paying, et cetera, yeah. is too long a cycle. Yeah. What schools use and parents by default then use is test results. Yeah, that's right. And I guess th those are the outcomes that yeah. that we have to use as a shorthand. Yeah. I, I think I think this is more I I will argue that this is more of a symptom of a mismeasurement of better education. So since so much of a of a measure and eva the way that people evaluate whether a product is a better educational product is very often with some internal set of standards and heuristic that, that a district will use for right. purchasing, or it's a standardized assessment that they're going to measure at the end of fifth grade and eighth grade or whatnot. Um, I personally question whether those are actually proxies for quality at all. Yeah. And meanwhile, the thing that they ignore, which I think is the right proxy, is well, what's the level of student engagement? Mm -hmm. Like, are students excited and and eager to to take the next step in that lesson, or or to to understand this concept? And that's largely ignored by most people designing educational products because they're striving for some platonic ideal of of raising a standardized assessment, and and they're just they're just missing it. And so when you when you understand that a child's motivation is central to learning, you, you I mean, one of our internal principles, you can't teach a child something that they don't care to understand. Hmm. Like if they don't want to understand it, no amount of trying to shove it down their, 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 their throat will lead to any kind of learning outcome whatsoever. Yeah. And so when, when you understand that, when you see motivation as essential to learning, you get an immediate feedback loop. And students students respond right away. You can tell whether they're learning. Students want more of this. And so I think that this idea that there's a long cycle to measuring improvement is, is one of the sort of legacies of the educational yeah. system that we're still working to shed yeah. because we lack a real measure of, of, of uh, learning outcomes. Yeah, 100% agree with that. I mean, I, I think a huge part of it is, is the side effect of the way that we do the measurements. And, and therefore, like the way that we measure quality, quote unquote, ends up skewing in a very particular way, which has all sorts of downstream consequences. It, it, and I think, I think the, the, the disconnect that people feel between, well, I've made a product which is better according yeah. to this mistaken measure of quality, yeah. but gosh, it's just not working in the market. Like I'm not getting in the reception. It's not that the market doesn't value quality. Question the assumption. It's maybe maybe what I thought was an indication of better quality is really not an indication of better quality. The um, just to uh, advance that conversation a little bit, something that I struggle with a lot is that the educational system that we're stuck with today was uh, building children. Um, building outcomes for a world that doesn't really exist anymore. Yeah. Um, the world has changed so much. And I think one of the issues we have with measuring quality is for what? Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot of questions being posed as to what the value of an education actually is in yeah. in, in actual long-term outcomes for children. How, do, how should we even think of that? And how would one advise an ed tech company who's trying to build some platonic ideal in that world for what to do? It's a great question. I, th I think you're basically, I mean, the, that is the core of the problem, right? Is like, w what are we actually building the educational system for and towards what end? And I think, I don't think there's a great answer right now, honestly. And I think it's, it's as much a public policy question as it is a technology question. Um, like, what are we actually trying to optimize for? And um, I think all that, people are, for what it's worth, I think what, what's starting to happen is people are starting to at least realize that it's broken. Uh, and so I think that whole generation of people that sort of went through that system and, and ended up kind of, you know, misaligned for the skills that, that you actually need in the job market today are realizing that system is broken. But I don't think there is like a, there's not a cohesive plan that I've seen that says like, here's how to actually fix it. Um, and so I wish I knew the answer to that personally, but I, I don't think there's actually like, I don't think there, I haven't really seen a great solution to it other than 
sort of very point wise, oh, we should have more STEM education or we should, um, you know, get programming in, in earlier, you know, schools or I think there's sort of these like point wise solutions that are very tactical, but there isn't like a cohesive strategy that I've seen. Yeah, programming is an interesting one. Sorry, Keith, you wanted to say something. Go ahead. I, I think you you absolutely have to have an opinion on that fundamental question. If you are building an education company, you have to have an opinion on what is the purpose of education? Because if it's to create more of a certain kind of professional because of a career shortage, that will lead to a whole set of decisions and, a, and an assessment of progress. Or if it's you know GDP growth, or you know, there's many yeah. I think mistaken views of what the purpose of education is, and and the fact that that as a culture we don't have alignment on that, you know that speaks to to the system that's being pulled in so many different directions. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I mean we we hold a very strong unconventional view on it, and it's that the ultimate purpose of education is that children grow up and live happy and productive lives, and even taking something like science. Like I think it is an absolute mistake to say that we should teach children more science because there's a lot of STEM careers out there that 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 need to be filled. Like that's absolutely the mistaken approach. And many people hold that view Why do you and think it leads mis- leads towards a bunch of wrong decisions. Why do you think it's mistaken? Um it's a great it's a great long conversation we're trying to <laughs> condense it. Uh, but I'll I'll, I'll give you a, a data point which will speak to it. Yeah. I think if there was a young child who knew that he or she wanted to be a dancer, Mm -hmm. that's the profession they knew they wanted to be, and there was no chance that they wanted to pursue a STEM career, they should, that child too, should learn science. Mm -hmm. It's not that they should learn science because of a particular career outcome, because the implication of that is once I decide that's not the career, then like, forget this, I don't need this this knowledge anymore. There's, I think there is a fundamental baseline understanding of the world that you're surrounded by, the way it works, and, a, and a, the habits of thinking that you form by figuring out how the world works. And so science is this body of knowledge, this core knowledge about how the world works, and it's a methodology in discovering these truths about the world. And every child should learn that because it will enable them to be a happier and more successful dancer just as it will a happier and more successful programmer. So where do you think the bounds of that kind of end? Is it like computer science and, and programming? Is it math? Is it you know writing skills? Is it re- like that's where, that's where absolutely is- the right question, and it is the harder question to answer. Which is, so what does a core fundamental pedagogical you know a pedagogy and curriculum consist of in order to maximize for as many children as possible growing up and living happy and productive lives? Like I, that's. There's a lot of healthy debate that should be happening there. I wish that was the debate that was happening. Hmm. I wish there was agreement on the outcome and, and the purpose of this all, because then we'd be having the right discussion. You know, the industry would be having the right discussion. I, I love that that um, you make the point that people can live happier, more fulfilled lives by knowing science. Uh, I'm not sure that there's a lot of evidence to <clears throat> to back that up, but I, I would like to make <clears throat> a point and maybe ha- a, a, a start a discussion on on the social case for certain kinds of education because because what certain types of education does bring to kids is critical thinking and the ability to ask hard questions and think skeptically about about the world which seems relevant today for all sorts of reasons wouldn't isn't even a more powerful argument is that when we're we're, we're educating our, our our kids to be productive citizens of the 21st century, and without an understanding of the scientific method and what science implies for everything, how, as an example, th- there's more, right? Uh, how can you be that productive citizen? What do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's hard to argue with. I think critical thinking skills, you know, science, math. I would argue actually programming just as a as a framework to think logically and clearly about the world. Uh, writing, I think the ability to communicate effectively. I think these are all just foundational skills, regardless of what you end up end up doing. Uh, so, no argument for me on that. I think the hard part is, can you be happy and productive if you don't have a job? Like, just to bring it back to earth a little bit, is like, if I can't feed my family, am I going to be happy and productive? Um, and that's, I think, kind of like where the boundaries are. Is like to but are what? Those separate? Wouldn't you argue as well that if you think clearly and you have great communication skills, you're better positioned to get a job in 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 the world that's being created all around us than otherwise? Uh, maybe. I mean, 
uh, I'd like to think so. <laughs> I'd like to think so. Like you know, as a as somebody who you know loves reading philosophy and science fiction and you know loves music and all these things, I would like to think so. But you know, like I th- I think the edge cases are kind of the interesting ones. Like you know, if you have an English degree. Um, and you know, there's a gross undersupply of data scientists. Like that feels like a like could that person learn how to do Python and SQL and like go get that job? Absolutely, they're smart. They could certainly do that. But like that is that like a missed opportunity? Is that person now like in an awkward place, having taken a hundred thousand dollars in debt when they probably should have just like done you know could have done something else? Not probably, but yeah. maybe. And, like and those like a... boundary conditions, I think, are the tough part. I, I think you have to be really careful with the the societal argument. You know, and, and so there was a subtle switch where, where you're saying, but what about the societal? This is good for all of us if people learn these skills. And I agree with your restatement of it. It is, you're right, it is good for every one of those individuals to learn those skills because it will help them. But it, but I don't think we can justify this on the grounds of, but it's good for society. And I'll give you an example. Like my, my wife was, was someone who was in, um, it, you know, AP math and, and science classes in, in high school. And, as a woman who was good at math, she got a lot of pressure to to join the math team and be the the female math representative for the school, and and it, it was really hard for her for a while because her passion was history and the social sciences. But there was lots of pressure because it would be good for society to have more female representation, and she struggled with that for a little while. Ultimately, she pursued the things that made her m- more happy and fulfilled, not the thing that other people felt would be good for society because of some metrics that we need to hit. And I think that as soon as you hold a societal standard, you you very quickly start to make decisions which will be at odds with what any one individual would want for themselves because it's it's best for society. Yeah. And I think like sort of probing on that a little bit more, to me the hardest trade-offs are, are actually – for the individual in those sort of like edge case situations. Like it's an interesting example. Like um, if if your passion is in one direction and you could go really deep on that, but all the jobs are in the other direction, like setting aside some baseline level of scientific method and math and you know, you're know you going to a good college, like th- that's kind of an interesting and hard individual trade-off. Um, and that I think starts to get at actually like what what is the purpose and what are you optimizing for mm-hmm, uh, as mm-hmm. a system? Um, because I think in a lot of those cases, it, I think there are, you know, you can look at, let's say, unemployment rates for people who have a college degree, and it's it's actually relatively low, right? It's below 5%. And it's really like whether or not you have that college degree that changes whether or not you're employed. Um, but there are a lot of nuances to that. There's underemployment. There's how, you know, what kind of salary growth potential do you have? And, and I, I think, um, I don't know, I think I take a little bit more of a pragmatic approach of like probably more people should be getting computer science degrees and like learning data science. Uh, and that's like if, better for if the individual. more people want to be getting yeah, computer science degrees. But, but it's a it's a critical and important part of being happy and fulfilled that you have a like job that pays you well and that you can like feed your family and you feel comfortable and like that's an that's an important part uh, above and beyond like your. It's a whole separate conversation whether you believe that having a job is a critical <laughs> part of happiness. Um, because and it's easy for those of us who have the sorts of jobs that frankly the people in this room have yeah. where they're um you know we're, we're the opposite of wage slaves mm-hmm. where, which is what most people are and so that's a different conversation uh, but it is interesting to talk about the the societal goals of 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 education to I mean education public education in the United States was a was a was for the benefit of society as yeah. opposed to the individuals. I don't think people necessarily mm. knew that 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 p- getting people ready to to be good factory workers was good for them. It was more about we need factory workers, so we better educate them sufficiently so they can they they can be good. Let's let's um, bring the conversation back to education technology. Uh, my hope is that educational technology helps both individuals and society uh, achieve outcomes that 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 we we in this room and in the country would be happy with. What do you guys today recommend when you meet an ed tech founder? Uh, I suspect you probably say different things. Maybe you can each in turn say like if you, if someone tells you about their ed tech startup, uh, it's a hard general question to answer. But where do you guys sort of go with your advice? Do you do you? I'll start with you, Rachel. Do you do you sort of channel your 2011 self or do yeah. you do you talk about 
sort of how the world's changing and the opportunities that are thus created. Yeah, I, I try to channel Keith a little bit and I ask them what their motivations are <laughs> and uh, try to do what's good for the individual because I don't, I don't think there's a right answer. Right? There are a lot of reasons that people might want to start an education company. And so I think the foundational thing is really what is your motivation um, and why are you doing it? And and I think, especially in Silicon Valley, there's too much of a, of a lens of, well, if it's not a billion dollar outcome, or if it's not a $10 billion exit, it doesn't matter. And there are lots of motivations that people may have. And so the first step I think is what is your motivation? And there are lots of great businesses that people should start and could start that would have very, very meaningful impact on people's lives and their communities. Um, and there'll be $50 million businesses or $100 million businesses, and that's fantastic. Like, people should go do those things. Um, but if that's if that's kind of the zone that you're in and that's your motivation and that's what you want to do, then, then it comes down to, well, what are the right tactics to executing on that? And how do you stay really smart about it? Because the worst possible scenario would be you had this great thing. It was actually working. But, for example, tactically, you just ended up raising money in the wrong way. And, and now you've kind of gutted your company because you don't actually control it. You had these options, they're mispriced. Nobody can actually make money by being at your company. So you, you're, all your best people leave. Like you enter this bad death spiral if you like, you know, grew your company in the wrong way. So I think the fundamental thing is what is your motivation? Why do you want to do it? Okay, let's figure out what the best way to make that happen is. And there are tons and tons of great edu education and ed tech businesses that are all on that spectrum. Hmm. The, Sounds not too different than any other startup. Any other startup right. in that way. The, tactically then, the, the specific thing that I say about education is um, I try to get people to really double down in their understanding of what is the actual thing that you want to accomplish? Like, you know, you have your motivations and then if you're successful, a certain thing will happen in the world. And is the path that you're on the best way to necessarily make that thing happen in the world? Um, are you better off, for example, if you're if you're really into computer science education, there are lots of ways to make that happen that are not necessarily an education product, right? Are, are you actually better off trying to do job retraining? Are you actually better off doing it outside of school? Are you better off doing it inside of school? Is it actually at the high school level or the college level? Are you going to target subpopulation? There's so many ways to actually go about making that happen mm -hmm. um, that are sort of adjacent to ed tech. Uh, and so I, I think this kind of gets at is like, what is ed tech exactly is an open question. Uh, and they're kind of like ed tech heavy and ed tech light and you know, ed tech adjacent. Yeah, um, we've really sort of skirted over the fact that, yeah. that uh, actually Keith mentioned in the beginning, there's so many aspects to ed tech. You can slice and dice in many ways from the homeschool market to the elementary school market to the to the high school and then post-secondary market to... to um, to training sorts of markets, yeah. you know, at YC we funded lots of schools that train folks for yeah, like in Insight Data Fellows is a great what, example. Insight right? Data, um, Lambda School Lambda is training is people, yeah. people to be um, to be uh, programmers. Uh, so there's there's there it's a it's actually a pretty broad field. It seems like the opportunity has only grown in ed yeah. in, in what we're broadly calling ed tech, even in the United States. Asia totally. completely aside, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, and I, th I think those actually those things that are a little bit more on the fringes to me are are some of the most interesting because they right. start to sort of redefine what it means to to get an education, or they redefine outside the bounds of this sort of like public uh, education, uh, you know, real estate funded, tax funded sort of model, and, and start to start to explore what it means to actually get an education and stay educated and, and stay educated and, and, and stay educated relevant your exactly. Life, right? and, and I think those kinds of models are actually where there's a lot of potential innovation because they're free from a lot of the constraints that exist in in these models that have existed for fifty or hundred years, and that freedom I think breeds a lot of innovation. I, um, I agree with with most of what Avatul said, particularly with regards to giving someone advice on picking a business they're going to start. And most of my focus as well is on, you know, well, what are you going to be so excited to work on that you're not going to give up after two to three, four years? Because it's probably going to take you ten years. Yeah. So that you know that kind of heuristic when you're picking a business is more important than almost anything else. But specific to the education space, I think there's one. The most contrarian thing that I would share with someone is that the education space, um, you know, I like to say that we're a learning company, not an education company. I'm very interested in learning and how to improve learning. And when, when you think of yourself as a learning company, learning is a field that's, that's in its infancy right now. And it's, it's deceptive because it's an old industry. So it feels like, well, we figured all this out. And, you know, that's just like, I don't know, some efficiency gains that are left and things like that. But to me, learning is much more like genetic engineering or, uh, you know, and figuring out how to arbitrarily sequence DNA and inject it into an organism. Like the, the level of understanding we have about that, like we're still poking this black box of genetic engineering and trying to make stuff happen for the first time. That's the state of learning. And, and fundamentally, 
we st even though science has progressed for so long, the science of the mind is so is still at such a beginning. You take a field like physics, and we know so much about you know the furthest corners of the universe and and the, the subatomic level, whereas our level of understanding of psychology is is at this is at the level of physics when it was well maybe the gods are angry and they're shaking the ground and that's why there's an earthquake like we're still not that far beyond Freud where it's like I don't know maybe you went into this profession because your parents had a particular relationship with you and they steered you in that direction. It's, it's, it's very much like opening a computer and noticing that when you press this sequence of buttons, this part heats up. Like that's our level of understanding of the brain. It's like we, we image this thing and we notice where the blood flows and try and draw these conclusions about how it's working. So if you, anyone who wants to start a, a company in the learning space, to the extent that you, that you really think, focus on understanding the science of learning, it's a wide open territory. Like we are, actually still discovering profound truths about even something as simple as like space repetition and the power of that or or the role of concept formation and and what's the difference between being able to recite a, a fact and and that holding actually holding that fact as knowledge like we're at the beginning of a science and to the extent you figure out anything new there's there's huge business implications of that are you optimistic keith that we'll figure it out and that that we'll see a transformation in American education over the next five, 10, 15, 20 years that will actually make for better outcomes for individuals and society. And, and, and then maybe, Avishal, if you could answer the same question afterwards, we can sort of close on, on that note. Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I, I will say I'm long on, on the human race, right? So, <laughs> so we are very good at figuring things out and mastering sciences and, pl and plumbing them to new depths. And we will do that for learning and for pedagogy as we have for all of the other sciences. And, you know, there is this industry and this infrastructure, this education infrastructure that will crumble and go away and be replaced by another version and another version. And what's so exciting about the internet is, and, you know, the internet generally and mobile in particular is these disruptive forces give you these opportunities to rebuild the whole stack from the ground up. So most likely the business opportunities in the learning space will be outside of the, the existing stack. Like it's the fact that you can go straight to teachers and not have to go through an approval process is dramatically changing things. The fact that there's an internet and, and the, the cost structure fundamentally changes. And so. And to parents too. Right. So, so the science is wide open. The industry is going to be transformed multiple times in the next decade, and and we will take learning to the next level. Yeah, I'm uh, hard to argue with uh, not being optimistic about the human race. Uh, yeah, very optimistic <laughs> not about that. Hard, yeah, actually. <laughs> not, <laughs> no, I'm, not, I'm many an optimist. People wouldn't, but. Yeah, no, I, I, at least I, I mean, I guess it's um, at least as entrepreneurs, it's hard. You have to you have to be an optimist, right? Like you you can't. Imagine you're going to change the world for the better if you if you aren't. It's almost the definition of you, an just, entrepreneur. Is that yeah, it's, it's an like, optimist. You, yeah. you, you know it's impossible, but you're still going to go. Yeah, it's like how do you fight. decouple that, right? So as, right. as an entrepreneur, I think it's hard to to separate that, and so that my every, all of my beliefs are tinged by that personality trait. Um, but what I would say is, I I am very optimistic about the experiments that are happening uh, by you know reaching teachers in new ways, reaching parents in new ways, platforms like the iPhone or, or Android or iPad. Chromebook um, that sort of allow people to interact with information in novel and new and interesting ways, um, and things that are happening on the fringes, things that are that are education but don't look like education. Um, I think Insight is a good example. Um, I think people sort of exploring uh, the internet on their own and kind of going down a rabbit hole of you know open source or you know YouTube as a platform with Khan Academy. Like I think there are all these really interesting things happening on the fringes where. Um, some of them look like education, some of them look more like learning, and some of them look like job training. And so they all kind of have different flavors. I'm less optimistic about the sort of um, the likelihood that we dramatically change the state of public education in the United States anytime soon because there's just so many entrenched mm -hmm. components to that from funding to um, you know the, the psychology that, that Keith was talking about where like for the first couple of years it's really on the parent and then there's a handoff. There's so many like cultural and, and governmental and public policy things kind of rolled into that. I think unbundling that is going to take a long time. 
Um, but I think there are a lot of entrepreneurs kind of on the fringes that are doing really interesting things that, and that's often how disruption happens, right? It kind of comes from the side a little bit in, in very unexpected ways. And the timing can surprise you. So maybe we can leave on, uh, on a slightly more optimistic note, which is that I, I think even in public education, public education, we know a lot of Mm -hmm. what the solutions ought to be. So we're kind of in a unique position where there's a lot of structural reasons. It's hard to close the achievement gap and to and to overall improve outcomes, but we do know a lot of the outcomes. So um, since the stakes couldn't be higher, uh, I think that we have good reason to believe that that those that knowledge will eventually matter and that things will get better. I, I want to thank you both for uh, for podcasting with me <laughs> this afternoon. It's been a great conversation. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks. Likewise. Thanks.